is our everything. You know, we're his everything. No, that's for real. We're his everything. You know, I, I, I love just biblical context. And one of the things that Christ did a good job of is he would draw parallels to, to what was happening in our everyday lives. And, and there's a particular passage where he's talking. And he's like, don't you trust God to give you what you need to have? And he actually uses the example of our earthly fathers. He said, if your earthly father knows how to give a good gift, can't your heavenly father? And as I look at the time that I'm sitting here, tired as could be, but I don't mind getting the nasal aspirator and sucking a whole bunch of snot out of my son's nose at three in the morning. I'm, I'm, can I be real for a second? Three in the morning. Yeah, I want to scream and cry too. <laughs> but I love you enough to do this. And so when we think about God being our everything, um, sometimes we have to remember that we're his everything. We have to remember that. And so today's context is just that we're moving into this space where we're talking about John 4. And this amazing thing takes place where Christ meets a woman. But understand, this is not just any kind of woman. This is a Samaritan woman. Now, what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks before we get into October, October is where we're really going to put our foot on the gas with this John chapter 4 stuff. Uh, but right now, we have to really set some context for what we're seeing here. And when we talk about a Samaritan woman, uh, in, in the cultural context of Christ in his time, that would be like me cussing right now. It would. It would it's that bad. It's that bad. They actually used, in John chapter 8, called Jesus a Samaritan as an insult and as a way to, to delegitimize his ministry. So when we talk about the Samaritan woman, we're talking about a context that can only be personified through racism for us to understand. Come on, can we, can we do that here? Uh, we're, we're talking about a racist time, a lot like today, where you're seeing someone that Christ had no business talking to simply because of her ethnicity. No other reason. So much so that calling Christ that same ethnicity was an insult. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? Can you imagine if calling somebody black was an insult? Oh, now he black. Don't listen to him. Whoa, like, where did that come from? Like, but that's the context that we're looking at. But today, as, as I was kind of just meditating and, and speaking with Pastor Troy about what we wanted to do, uh, it was all about setting the stage as we get into some of these really key theological points that we see in just this interaction with the Samaritan woman at the well. Last week, Pastor Troy told us about uh, uh, this amazing woman who ended up being uh, uh, the mother of evangelism. Remember that? The mother of evangelism, that this Samaritan woman who had one encounter with Christ ended up birthing an entire ministry out of that one moment. Such an amazing thing. But here are some things that we're going to learn today that's key when it comes to the character of God that created this moment. The character of God that created this moment. We're going to look at John chapter 4, uh, verse 13, where it starts by saying, Jesus replied to the woman, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. We're talking about the well that they're sitting at. Verse 14 says, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water that I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Verse 16, go and get your husband, Jesus told her. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I'm like, what does that have to do with what she just asked for? Can I just show you how I like, I like to read the biblical context? I'm just like, okay, God, why, why would Jesus ask, go get your husband? And as you look this up, you'll see all kinds of people talk about it. Like, you know, in order for someone to really be saved, you got to deal with the sin first. And in order to deal with the sin, Christ had to call out the fact that she had multiple husbands and all the different things. And she was even living with someone who wasn't her husband. And, you know, basically he had to call out the harlot inside of her. 
okay, cool, that sounds great. Um, but the cross did that, amen? Uh, and so what are we looking at when it comes to the biblical context? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to do a quick history lesson here, and we're going to go all the way back, all the way back. Because one thing that we have to do when we see this question that Christ asks, this command that says, go get your husband, uh, we have to then begin to understand what, what the Samaritans are, how the Samaritans became the Samaritans, and what led to the context of him sitting down with the woman that people felt like he should not even be talking to. So we go back 700 years prior to this event, and we see that the northern kingdom falls to the Assyrians. What are you talking about, Orlando? So, quick history lesson. The people of Israel came to the land that they were promised to after they left out of Egypt. And when they got to this land, they took it, they possessed it, they fought for it, all the different things. Why? Because God said, this is yours. You are my people, I am your God, and I will give you a land. And in that land, you're going to experience me in a way that no one else ever has. And from that, the world will be blessed. Sounds great, doesn't it? But what took place? What took place? Throughout the time that the Israelites were in the land that they were promised, in the land of milk and honey, they didn't quite make all the right decisions. Amen. Amen. One of the first things that they did was they asked for a king. They asked for a king. I know this part is kind of boring, but I don't want to assume that anyone knows the context that we're speaking from. So I'm just going to take some steps through this. One of the first mistakes that they made was they asked for a king. God, every other country around has a king. They have a ruler. Everybody else has one. Why can't we? Are we catching some of the context here? Are, are we catching how God has used uh, the children of Israel, has used the covenant of Abraham as a way to help us see ourselves. The people said, everyone else has one, why can't we? Wow. I'm not looking forward to when my son asks me that question. Pray for him when he does, I'll be like, uh, let's go to the uh, kings and look at why. You don't want what everybody else wants, right? right. <laughs> That's for real, because what we have to recognize within the biblical context is that we are seeing ourselves. And just like the people of Israel, sometimes we get to a place where we rather look around and ask God, this is what they have, why can't we? We do. Sometimes we even do it with another church. Well, this church got this, why can't we? Well, everybody else is able to do this. Why can't I? Well, you know, sometimes, like, I just look around, and uh, I got cousins that's out here doing what they want to do, living their best life, hot girl, summer, city boy, this, all this other stuff. God, why can't I do the same thing? Why can't I wild out? They wild out, and, and they still okay. She wild out, and she married. Okay. Just trying to be authentic, everyone. I asked the same questions. Let me be real. I, I was sitting here in church, grew up right here, got baptized right there in 1997 in that same pool. Amen. Grew up right here. I look, everybody looking at me like, oh, Orlando's so, that, that young man's anointed. Oh, he's blessed. He's got a future on him. Whole time I'm like, but I ain't got a girlfriend, so like I don't. <laughs> don't nobody want me. Like I'm, I'm, I'm desperate out here, y'all. Come on, y'all. Look, look for real. Can I be real? Let's be real. I went to an all boys high school. Went to an all boys high school. I didn't. Only girls I saw was in church, and I was on it. <laughs> Hello. Hello, you know, because there, there's this thing in, in, in our culture, right, within church culture where, where men will come up like, uh, I believe you're my wife. <laughs> Don't even know their name yet. Like, what? You heard from God that who? She's already engaged. How you? Anyway, uh, I'm sorry. That's, that's another time. That's another time. But there's a place that we get to. I got to that place myself where it was just like, but I want to be like everybody else. 
I wish I could have a girlfriend. I wish people could think I was handsome. And, and to make it even worse, I mean, you had some of the older uh, uh, women in the church who were just like, honey, don't even worry about it. Look, let me tell you something. Tell you, you a handsome young man. They just don't know it yet. Them girls don't know what they want. <laughs> it's all right. It's, look, look, when you get older, they're going to be flocking. Don't you worry about it. That, look, look, thank you. The mothers be honest with you. I wasn't trying to hear it, though. Because when I got to college, I said, nope, I'm going to be a whole new person. When I, got, when I got to college, they didn't know Orlando, the church dude. They didn't know the skinny dude with the big head who wore a suit to church every Sunday. I was in Tuskegee, Alabama, a whole other time zone, okay? They was in central time. I said, okay, I'm in a different time zone. I'm acting like a different person because I wanted what everyone else had, or at least I thought I did. But just like, just like the children of Israel, I made a mistake in thinking that I wanted what everyone else had. And in that, God gave them a warning. He said, look, let me tell you something. If you want a king, let me tell you what's going to happen. They're going to take your possessions. They're going to take your land. They're going to take your sons and send them to war. They're going to do, these are all the things that are going to happen because that's what happens when you have a king. That's not me. When you have a king, that's not me. That's another lesson for another day. But that's what we see takes place with the children of Israel. Now, what does that have to do with what you're talking about, Orlando? Everything. Because in that, the children of Israel had a lot of kings. And it, how many of my Bible scholars here can name the amount of kings who were good kings? Yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> Woo, them kings was on some other stuff, y'all. On some, I mean, their most famous king, David. Great king, great man. Saw somebody bathing on the rooftop. Another man's wife and said, I want that. Come on. And he was supposed to be, because the country was at war, he was supposed to be at battle like a good king but decided to stay home, saw another man's wife on the rooftop. She was minding her own business, because mind you, for cultural context, she was supposed to be on a rooftop bathing. That's supposed to happen, right? He wasn't supposed to be home. Saw another man's wife and said, I want that. And then decided, after he got her pregnant, okay, now we gotta make your husband come home from the battle that I sent him to and, and make them, you know, do their thing. But this man had more honor than the king did and said, I'm not gonna have sex with my wife because my men are at war. So he had more integrity than the king did. More integrity than the king did. And said, no, 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 it's not okay for me to have my men at battle and I'm at home enjoying my wife. That's not okay. I'm gonna have some character here and I'm not gonna do that. Then the king, David, sends him into battle and tells him, look, now when y'all advance, I need y'all to fall back so he can get killed. And then I'm going to set up a wedding, a shotgun wedding, and I'm going to get his wife pregnant on behalf of his honor. I mean, low down, dirty, just foul. Just, ooh. I mean, now that I'm married, like, I, I look at that story totally different. Like, you did What? And, we, and it was cool, too. That was like one of his buddies. Man. All right, let me, let me be quiet. <laughs> but the, the moral of the story is this is what the children of Israel asked for. It's what they wanted. They asked for it. And within that, you have a son named Solomon. And Solomon took after his daddy in a lot of the worst ways. Solomon had so many wives and concubines and we know what concubines are for, amen? He had some vices. He had some vices, but let's talk about what that looked like because now we're gonna go to 1 Kings chapter 11, verse two, as we talk about Solomon because this is the context that sets up what we have right now. We had a a people who were delivered out of captivity into a promise, and instead of thanking God, they decided to look at what everybody else had around them and wanted just that. We want a king like everybody else, and they got what kings do. 
Their kings acted like kings. They lacked character and integrity. First Kings chapter 11, verse 2, it says, The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they would turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. This is who we're talking about, one of the kings. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. That's important. Verse 4, in Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of completely, instead of being completely faithful to the Lord, his God, as his father David had been. Solomon worshiped all kinds of gods. Ashtoreth, the goddess of Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. In this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to follow the Lord completely as his father David had done. On the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, he even built a pagan shrine, the detestable god of Moab, and another for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. Solomon built such shrines for all his foreign wives to use for, during in, for burning incense and sacrificing to their gods. Verse 9 says, the Lord was very angry with Solomon for this, for his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel who had appeared to him twice. He had warned Solomon specifically about worshiping other gods, but Solomon did not listen to the Lord's command. Now, before we start judging Solomon, how many of us have heard something specific from the Lord and decided not to do it? Again, this is just a mirror for ourselves. We can talk about Solomon all day long, but a lot of us worship all kind of gods that ain't got nothing to do with God. Your job them shoes. Amen. That car. That church. Let me keep going before I get stoned. Um, verse 11. <laughs> so now the Lord said to him, since you have not kept my covenant and have disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. Mark that. But for the sake of your father, David, I will not do this while you are still alive. I will take the kingdom away from your son. Even so, I will not take away the entire kingdom. I will let him be king of one tribe for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, my chosen city. So for my historians out there who love looking at biblical narrative over the whole course of the thing, this is the beginning of why we have Samaritans. This racist space that the children of Israel lived in started because a king disobeyed God. A king that the children of Israel asked for disobeyed the Lord and began to worship other gods. Why? Because he was married to women who worshiped other gods. Who you marry makes a big difference in the course of your life. That's for real. My wife asked me last night, like, are you a Colorado friend? Yes, we are. Yes, we are Colorado fans. Not just me, we are Colorado fans. Deion Sanders, all of that. Praise God. <laughs> when I met her, she was talking about, yeah, you know, uh, my dad is a Patriots fan. Oh, that's cute. But you married to me now. <laughs> Bengals all day. Who they? I get it. You grew up. You grew up with your daddy all this time. Patriots this, Patriots that, Tom Brady, a bunch of Super Bowls, and I don't mean nothing no more. You married to me now. We ain't gonna have no Patriots stuff in my house, okay? That's a, that's a practical way to look at it, right? We make the joke, but we ain't about to have a divided house. We gonna look, mm-mm. No, you're going to have me wearing a Bengals jersey and you wearing a Patriots jersey on a Sunday. No, ma'am. You can put that up. Keep that at your daddy's house. You with me now. I'm, look, that's for real. That's what happens when you get married. That's what happens when you get married. Y'all become one. That includes our football team. I'm sorry. <laughs> includes that. Like, everything. Every part of me is yours now, right? I don't understand what you're not getting about this. Like, there, there can't be... 
separation in any area of our lives because we love each other, okay? All right, oh my bad, I'm sorry. I, I realized I didn't stepped on some toes in here. <laughs> stepped on some toes, amen. I don't mean to cause any arguments in the car. Y'all be all right. But that's what happens, that's what took place. That's what the children of Israel asked for. And in that moment, God said, look, I am going to separate your kingdom into two. And so you had the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom called what? Who knows what it was called? Ju yes, Judea. Yes, Judea, the southern kingdom of Judea. So in that moment, you saw this take place. Now, what does it have to do, again, what we're talking about? I know it's a little boring. We're doing a little history lesson here. But what happened after that? For about 200 years, they were two separate kingdoms. Over 200 years, there were two separate kingdoms. One family was now split into two different factions, two different governments, two different kingdoms. They even had two different sets of prophets. Isn't that crazy? We all the same family. But after 200 years, of suffering the consequences of what somebody else did, now here we are, we hate each other. We do. Is family not the same way? How many families have been torn apart because the mother or the father did something crazy that it had nothing to do with the kids, and now all of a sudden, 20 years later, y'all not talking no more? Siblings not talking because of something that had nothing to do with either one of them. Suffering the consequences of the previous generation, in the previous generation, in the previous generation. The reality of what takes place throughout our actual lives can be found in the biblical narrative, guys. That's why it's so important to read. You begin to connect some dots. Like, that sounds a lot like my, my family, because, you know, my granddaddy, you know, he, he was a vet, and he had PTSD, and, you know, he did some stuff to my grandmother that wasn't great, but then that led to, you know, this one got this mental health thing, and this one got that, and this one, you know, bipolar, and that one schizophrenia, and all of a sudden you got some, some grandkids with PTSD and anxiety and all, and all because of something that ain't had nothing to do with me. Generation after generation, things take place and people suffer the consequences. And so the consequences of a king that they ask for, not following and staying true to God as he should have, resulted in over 200 years of one family acting as if they were two. And thus the seed that led to literal racism was planted. But one thing that always kind of bothered me about the concept of like the Samaritans not being viewed as the same as the Jews and, and not loving each other to the point where like in order to take a trip, they would extend the trip to go around Samaria to get to where they had to get to. Like I'm not about to go to my cousin's house because I don't like them for real like that. <laughs> I know, I get it because I know there are some people who, who really study who would kind of be offended by what I just said. They would, they would. Jews would be offended by what I just said. They absolutely would. They'd be like, no, nah, we're not the same. It's not the same thing. How dare you say that? But if I look at the history, y'all was the same kingdom. The same people with the same mess that led to the same thing. To the point where the Assyrians came a couple hundred years later and took the Northern Kingdom. And in a couple hundred years after that, the Babylonians came and took the southern kingdom. So if I look at the context, y'all are really the same kind of people who made the same mistakes. But instead of remembering that, they took the time to hate each other. They took the time to hate each other. Orlando, why are you taking us through all this boring stuff? Because if we look at all of the people who proclaim Christ who hate each other, after thousands of years of sectarian behavior, that's all it was. We the same family. 
but we can't worship together? How does that even work? How? how? No, for I'm actually asking, how does that work? It's no different because we have how many denominations? There are more churches than there are McDonald's franchises. For what? There's a place where I live. There's a street with three churches right next to each other. Two of them almost share the same parking lot. It's that wild. All four churches, you can throw a stone and hit each other. My only question, and I don't want to offend nobody, is that God? Or does it sound just like the Israelites who looked at the Samaritans who forgot after 200 plus years that they were always family? That the same promise that led you to what we now call Samaria is the same promise that led me to Jerusalem. Sometimes we forget what took place, but today God is calling us to remember. So again, Orlando, can you please connect this to what you're talking about when it comes to this random question that Christ asked the woman at the well? He said, go and get your husband. Because the root of why you're here, the root of why you're a Samaritan and we can't talk is because somebody else married the wrong person a long time ago. Let that sit in. Somebody else married all the wrong people 700 years ago. And now when you see me at this well, instead of asking me for a drink, you ask me, why are you talking to me if you're a Jew? Instead of taking the time to get this, this, this living water inside of you to, to bubble up like a spring, because you forgot after 700 years, the question didn't have anything to do with the woman at the well going to get her four or five husbands. It was God undoing the very thing that led to the circumstances that said that he shouldn't be there in that moment. That's what took place. In the biblical context, God said, look, I, I understand that this king that you asked for, because you didn't want me to be your king, the king that you asked for through marriage created a rift in my people. And in order for me to, to bridge that gap again, I have to send my son to that same place. I have to send him to the same place. It may take 700 years, but I'm gonna send him to that same place to mend those same broken wounds that started with marriage, I'm going to end it with marriage too. I want to see your husband. Had nothing to do with the man that she was sleeping with, had nothing to do with who she was married to, had nothing to do with the gods that she was worshiping as a result of her many marriages, but it had everything to do with what is it that you hold near and dear to your heart, give me that. That thing that you asked for, give me that. That thing that's keeping you away from me, give me that. The thing that started this mess 700 years ago, give me that. The thing that caused generational strife over the course of multiple kings, multiple prophets, multiple wars, give me all of that. Because I want to deal with it at the root. That's the God that we serve. A God that was so intentional that he set in motion a plan that would right all the wrongs that took place in that one moment with that one woman at the one well, in the place that he had no business being, talking to someone he had no business talking to, he decided to right a wrong that was in place for over 700 years. That's the character of the God that we serve. So what does this have to do with what you're talking about, Orlando? The message for today is remember the promise. Because everything that Christ does, as we dive into John 4, we have to remember this about the character of Christ, the character of the God that we serve. Everything that God does is connected. It is purposeful. It is not by mistake. 
It is with the purpose, it is with the charge, it is with the most clarity that you can possibly have, and there are things that he's doing in each and every one of our lives that have nothing to do with us and everything to do with us at the same time. That thing that your great-great-grandfather did that you have no idea set the course of your family, he's dealing with that. That thing that they did to you back in middle school, he's dealing with that. That thing that happened to you that nobody knows about, he's dealing with that. The thing that you're afraid of that will happen for your children, he's dealing with that. Because that's the God we serve. But why would God do such a thing? I asked that question. Because I was like, you know, God, that's kind of cool that you would do that, but like, why though? What does that even mean? Why, why is it cool to make this connection between marriage and what took place with Solomon and now what's taking place with the woman at the well? Why are you telling me this? And he said something very clearly. He said, the promise was before the pain. The promise was before the pain. All the pain and the generational strife that took place from generation to generation over 700 years, there was a promise that came long before that. There was a promise that came before the punishment because a part of the punishment was to tear the kingdom in two. And then another punishment happened after that to the northern kingdom because they too were worshiping other gods. They got conquered by the Assyrians. Before there was a punishment, there was a promise. I made a promise before all the pain, a promise before all the generational strife, a promise before I had to give you a consequence for your bad actions. Before you asked for kings that would get you in the position that they got you in, I made you a promise. And what is that promise? What is that promise? Genesis 12 and 1. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country your people in your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That was a promise that God gave to Abram. Generations, generations before Solomon ever made a mistake. Generations before David ever created a mess. Generations before the people asked for a king. Generations before they turned against him. Generations before the times that they wanted to stone Moses uh, because they didn't believe that the promised land was theirs because there were giants that inhabited. Generations before they were in Egypt in captivity. Generations before they were set free. Generations before the Ten Commandments. Generations before all of the law and the prophets. They were made a promise through Abram. It's a promise that happened before that. So yes, even though the children of Israel made all kinds of mistakes that led to the situation they were in, to the point where they were racist towards their own cousins, God decided, I'm gonna send my son through Samaria because those are my people too. That's all right, about one or two of us got that. About one or two of us got that because the reason why we didn't celebrate right now, because this is what the Lord made very clear to me as I was preparing this message, was that some of us genuinely believe that the mistakes that were made over the course of our lifetime negate the promise. But I'm telling you right now, your 70 years of raising hell can't stop what God wants to do. If the children of Israel could have 700 years of foolishness and God still shows up to make it all right, then your little seven-week tirade of being whoever you want to be ain't nothing to God. God is able and willing to do what he said he would do every single time. And in this moment where he meets this woman who's a Samaritan who looked at him and said, you shouldn't even be talking to me 
And his response was, but if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for a drink of water. What he was saying was, if you understood that my promise is still true, if you understood that what I said to Abram has nothing to do with your crap right now, then you would ask me for a drink of water. But how many of us don't feel worthy enough to ask God for a drink of water because of our mess? Because of the stuff that we've done. Because of the things that we went through. Because of not only that we did, but the things that happened to us too. I'm too dirty to ask for a drink from you, God. I'm too dirty. I've been through too much. My family's broken. My home is broken. I can't do this. But the character of God says, way before all of that, I made a promise. I made a promise. And the one thing our God does not do is break his promises. He's not going to break his promises, y'all. I'm going to stay right here because some of us still believe that God's not going to keep his promise just because I didn't keep my end of the bargain. I didn't keep my end, so the contract is now null and void because I didn't, I didn't do my part. And we even teach that sometimes. We do. We teach that. We literally tell people. Sometimes it's, it's subliminal. It's by the questions we ask. I'm going through a financial situation right now. Are you tithing? Are you tithing? Is that? We don't even know that we just told them the reason why you in trouble is because you didn't hold up your end of the bargain. That's what we just said. Is that the promise isn't true. As if he didn't promise that he'd take care of us. The problem isn't that you're in a financial situation. The problem is you're worried about it. Yeah. Ain't, got to do with, ain't got nothing to do with tithing. How do I know? Because that's what Jesus said. He said the birds don't even store stuff up. They don't put nothing in the storehouses. They don't worry. They just live. They just do what they're supposed to do. They're birds. They chirp in the morning. They sing all day and they fly. And poop on your car. That's what they do. But please catch this when I say it. They do what they're made to do. And because they do what they're made to do, they don't have to worry about nothing. Sorry, some of us. And so Christ is talking to this Samaritan woman who's talking to him about cultural stuff and racism and saying, you shouldn't be talking to me and it's like, you don't even know what I'm made to do. Yeah. If you knew what I was made to do, you'd ask me. Yeah. If you knew who I was and what I was sent to do, yeah. you wouldn't be talking to me about racism right now. Yeah. If you knew who I was, you wouldn't be having this conversation right now. If you understood not just who I am, but matter of fact, who you are, yeah. Yeah. you wouldn't be asking me this conversation. Yeah. We're going to stay right here because there's a lesson in that that we're missing, that we miss, that we miss because when we pray, we don't even pray how we're supposed to. A lot of us pray like the woman at the well. That's how we pray. God, I need. Oh, God, if you could just get me out of this situation. God, you, hey, God, I'm in, a, I'm in a sting right now and I need you to come. See, a lot of us think our prayer life is supposed to be vibrant when we go through stuff. It's the only time we talk to God. When you need him to come through in a way that he already knows he need to come through. I'll tell you something. I love my wife. I love my wife. Nothing gets on my last nerve as much as being like, can you take out the trash? I already had in mind to take out the trash. When the game got over, I can get up and take the trash out. <laughs> it's not that you asked me to take out the trash. It's that I literally just got done thinking, let me take out the trash. I just thought it for myself. You had to say nothing. I know I'm supposed to take the trash out. Why are you even saying something to me about it? Like, I'm going to forget to take the trash out. I'm going to take the trash out. God's the same way. Why are you talking to me about your financial situation? I already have a blessing in store for you. That was my wife that just brought it out. I, I know you broke. Yes. Why are you talking to me about something I already know about? 
why are you asking me this? Oh, you don't believe I'm going to bless you unless, I, unless you ask for it. You don't believe I'm going to come through for you unless you beg me for it. You don't believe it. But if you really knew who you were and who I am, you'd just be blessing me right now. You spend more time praying to me about how good I am if you actually knew that. But instead, we'll be like, you know, God, I ain't supposed to be trying to go on no trip because I ain't got no money for real. It's like, first off, I'm about to make all of that work out together if you would just shut up and get out my way and trying to figure everything out. Do you have faith or not? Come on, I'm serious. Some of y'all know the story about how we bought a house. We ain't had no, nothing in our savings. We had just got married. What's even crazier is that when I actually met my wife, I had just transitioned out of a job. Transition, I was making, I was taking home like 1200 a month, living with my mama, and I'm about to marry a girl? Making $600 every two weeks? And can, please understand that like, I'm not trying to talk about if you only make $600 every two weeks, that's not the point. As a man, I should be trying to marry no woman making six hundred dollars two weeks. Can I be real for a second? I, I got to be in a better position than what I was at at the time, or so I thought, or so I thought, because the world will sit here and tell you like, man, what you about to do? You ain't got enough money to take care of no woman. What you talking about? But God, I'm y'all. I'm, I'm I'm telling you about what I lived through, not just. Because a lot of us try to wait for the circumstances to change, not understanding that God wants you to step into your promise anyway. How do I know? Because the woman at the well was looking at the circumstances that said, this Jewish man shouldn't be talking to me, instead of taking the time to say, I don't care if he's Jewish or not, I need my blessing. This is, this is not, God, is it, is it clicking for us or not? Is it clicking for us or not? Because some of us are stuck in situations because of our circumstances. Yeah. And God's like, I don't care about racism. Yeah. I don't. I don't care about the circumstances that you're in. Well, you know, God, it's tough out here because, you know, they did put up all the barriers in the world against me. But I'm God. Like, why do you even care about the barriers? Yeah. I'm God and I'm for you but can you act like it from time to time? There's a lesson that God taught me in the middle of a, of a conversation, my son being sick right now, which is why he kept me up until three in the morning. Um, and, and some people would ask us like, um, have you thought about sitting him up while he slept? Like, you know, I've thought about that because usually when I'm sick, like, you know, he, I, he obviously has the same problem I have, it's just a post-nasal drip and, throat start hurting and be, you know, coughing up phlegm and all that other stuff. And so I'm like, maybe if we, you know what, maybe sitting him up would be smart for when he sleeps. Great. Do you have a boppy? Yeah, we got a boppy. Put him in a boppy and just let him sleep like that. It's like, um, maybe not the boppy. Maybe not. Maybe not the boppy pillow. Um, I'd rather not do that. Why not? Because the manufacturer said, don't let him sleep on it. Don't worry about that. Ain't ain't, ain't nothing. Sit. <laughs> did you have a past job with the company? Like, did you design this product that I don't know? Like, maybe you could have. I don't know. Maybe were you on the design team when they made it? No. So should I believe you or the manufacturer? I'm confused. I don't know. I don't know if I should. Ain't nothing gonna happen with that baby, you're fine. See, you're just a new parent, don't worry about it. See, you ain't got nothing to do with being a new parent. Part of that is true. I get that, I submit to the, to the whole concept of like, as a new parent, I do the most. And all these things are okay if it's, you know, you, by the time you get to your third or fourth, like our pastor, you don't care no more. <laughs> I could submit to that. I could submit to that. No, 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 don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong, because he's actually my example of someone who does care, <laughs> even if it's the fourth one, because the way he treats Austin is totally different from how he treats everybody else. He's very much like, hold on, wait, 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 wait. He still cares, he doesn't just let Austin run around and eat dirt, okay? 
<laughs> like some of us think it's supposed to happen, right? But it's the fact that the manufacturer said one thing and you're saying something else. The person that made the thing saying something different from what you're telling me right now. So I can either believe you just because you did it and everything worked out fine, or I can believe what the manufacturer says. Let me bring this home for you. A lot of us go around life trying to quote what everybody else is saying. This is what my grandmama said. This is what my daddy called me, and this person called me out my name, and this person said this, and da-da-da-da-da. But what did the manufacturer say? What did the manufacturer say? See, because some of us make decisions as if everything's going to be okay when the manufacturer clearly said, don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about sex, in case we're act, trying to act like we don't know about stuff. That's just one of the many things that we do that the manufacturer said don't do, but we do anyway. Yeah. And then wonder why consequences take place. Yeah. That's just the one that hit everybody in the chest. It's fine, because there's other ones too. There's other ones that deal with your finances. Yeah. I'm not just talking about tithing. Because tithing wouldn't be a problem in the church if we were just more generous in general. I'm not talking about to the church. I'm talking about to your family members who you, get, you just ignore because they're always asking for money. What did the manufacturer say? The manufacturer said, be generous. The manufacturer said, I love a cheerful giver. But if every time somebody asks you for money, you ask them for more bank statements than the bank do when you give a home loan, then I don't understand. For real. I've been hit with that. Oh, I need to see everything. Da, 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 da. I'm like, what? I'm literally buying a house right now, and that bank ain't asking me for that much. And they're about to give me $180,000 to buy a house, and you trying to give me 1000 to help with the down payment? No. No, I'm not, I'm not doing that. That don't make sense to me. <laughs> one plus one is still two, and you're trying to make it three. Like, that's not happening. We do it all the time, y'all. What did the manufacturer say? What did God say? God said, I, made a, I gave you a promise, and that through you the world will be blessed. That's the promise. Nothing else matters. Your mess don't matter. What they told you don't matter. What they say don't matter. All the things about you need a degree. You need a this. You need a that. You need this kind of experience. You need to go through this route to get to this place. God said, I don't care about none of that. I made you. I made the world. I made everything in it. It all belongs to me. So what I say is what goes every single time. But let's bring this home with the scripture and we'll be done. Galatians chapter 3 verse 15 says, Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say seeds, plural, meaning many people, but into your seed. Seed, meaning one person who is Christ. Verse 17, what I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. Let me say that one more time because sometimes we miss this when we have conversations about whether or not you're living right. That's called acts of work. That's, it's, it's, it's your work that you do. Some of us have a works-based faith, but God doesn't deal with works because your works will never be good enough. Verse 16 says, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture did not say seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, let's substitute the word law with your actions. Let's substitute the word law with your ability to live up to everybody else's standard. Let's substitute the word law with your family history. Let's substitute the word law with your family trauma. <laughs> For if the inheritance was based on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why then was the law given to all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. That's Jesus Christ. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. 
Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? What does this look like for us today? Does the pursuit of righteousness and holiness, is it opposed to the promise of God? Is the need to live up to the standard of the church opposed to the promise of God? Is the need to live an upstanding and moral, morally clean life opposed to the promises of God? Mm, absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. What does that mean? I have to break that part down. What's being said here is this. If your actions could save you, it would have happened already. If your actions could save you, it would have happened already. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. My brothers and sisters, what we saw in that moment brought together an opportunity where Christ said, I don't care about your history. I don't care about what this says or what that says. I don't care about all the wrongdoings that took place over hundreds of years. Your lifetime cannot stop my promise. Your character can't stop my promise. Your faults can't undo my promise. Because if they could, it wouldn't be a promise. God's not fickle like us. He doesn't make a promise and then go back on the promise because we didn't do what he wanted us to do. I know some of us are struggling with that because it's like, nah, holiness is still right. And it is. It is. But there's an order to the operation, y'all. It's an order to operation. We don't come to know Christ through obedience. We come to obedience by knowing Christ. There is a profound difference in the two. There's a profound and big difference in the two. What is the purpose of salvation? What is the purpose of coming to know Christ? What is the purpose of what is taking place at the well with this woman who did not deserve to talk to the Messiah, to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? The purpose was that there was a promise that was spoken long before she even existed. Long before she was in her mother's womb. Long before everything took place, before every husband, before every unclean act, before every altar sacrifice to a foreign God, God made a promise to Abraham. And that promise to Abraham was enough to sustain every single person in this room. Let me say that again. The promise that God made to Abraham is enough to sustain every person in this room. because Galatians just told us that the promise of Abraham is Jesus Christ himself. That was the promise. The promise that every person on earth will be blessed through your seed, through Jesus Christ. And in that moment, we see an example in John 4 where God said, I don't care what your history or your past is. I don't care that you and your ancestors worship other gods. The one who you're sitting in front of right now is the blessing to all of the earth. And if you just accept him and you just believe, I'll wipe away all the other crap that's in your life. So as we dive into John 4, moving into the rest of this time and in this year, we have to really reestablish who we believe God is, who we know God to be, his character, because his promise always takes precedence. So whenever you find yourself in a situation, whenever you find yourself arguing with yourself and in your flesh, remember God's promise. It's enough to sustain you. God bless you and I love you. Wow. Wasn't that an amazing message? Y'all, that was good. Now, if you want to know more about who Jesus is, or if you want to be baptized, or you're just looking for prayer, go ahead and comment below or send us a message and somebody will reach out to you to pray with you, to help sign you up for baptism, or to walk you through salvation. Now don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on the future messages that we have in this series. Lastly, now we love 
to see you in person here at TSMB Church. So come see us on Sundays at 10.30 a.m., 5550 Reading Road in Cincinnati, Ohio, in the Bond Hill area. We love you guys, and we can't wait to see you next week. Have a blessed week.